From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up. What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, a mailbag that we ripped through really, really fast, but it's pretty decent. And we finally start talking about the UGA game. 15 or so minutes with the reporter who covers the dogs. It's all coming up on today's show. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, cptallybar.com. That is the website. You want to know the daily lunch special? Just go to the website. Go to the website, but no, I'll read it to you, everybody. I'll read it to you. It's Friday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Enjoy an $8.99 special of chicken strips in a basket, hand-breaded, served with a dipping sauce, or tossed in a sauce of your choosing. Isn't it awesome how it works like that? Options, everybody. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, also a side dish. More options, straight fries, curly fries, onion rings, potato salad, coleslaw, broccoli, side salad, tater tots, or freshly cooked potato chips. It's all at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. If you're not going to be in Miami with Ira Corey and myself, Matt Lasser, go to the Corner Pocket, watch the game, hang out with some Knowles. Convalesce with each other, I think might be a word. I don't know. Wordchant.com, Ultimate Symbol Sports Source, thumbs up, five-star rating and review. Is that road noise I hear in the background? Is that road noise? Where's Corey, everybody? Corey, where are you there? Hello, Corey? I am here. I am uh, just got off the highway. Uh, a cop just pulled behind me. Um, I'm going 58 in a 55, so I don't think he's chasing me. Uh, but I'm on my way to uh, beautiful Moultrie from Tipton, Georgia. Okay. I, I thought we were going to have like a live police pursuit. I was a little nervous there for a second. but No, no. He's keeping his distance. He's keeping his distance. What's the? So I'm in a 55, and I just put my cruise at 60, knowing the cop is right behind me. Yeah. That's fair, right? Yeah, I mean, well, technically the limit's 55. You cannot go over the limit. You're going over the limit by five, but you would think that there's some discretion in there, a little grace, if you will. And he just pulled off the road. Uh, to a, he pulled on another road, so now I'm going to go 80 again. Okay. Anyway, let's get to it, Aslan. Okay, let's go to Jernal. Uh, Jernal longs for the days of bowl games mattering. He was in the 2012 Orange Bowl. Lonnie had a great game, launched us into that 2013 season. 2016 had big stakes. Dalvin, DeMarcus were sent off with a win. If you were pointed to the college football, Zardom, what changes would you make to revive bowl season so that it has meaning like it once did, or is that pretty much all dead and gone? I'll start us off here on this one, Corey. I just, it's going to have to be incentivized, which I guess at the heart of it then, no. It, this will never matter the way it used to because you have to be compensated to do it which those guys were not compensated to do it and we can talk about whether that's a sad thing a bad thing a good thing uh, we all have different opinions on it but you've joked about it I, I do think these bowl games sadly listen man, you have an all expense paid trip to Miami all expense paid trip to New York City all expense paid trip to San Diego you don't want to do that and hang out with your buddies and play the sport that you love and compete you don't want to do that I, I don't know if five thousand dollars from CBS or Fox or ESPN or whoever's televising that game is going to make these kids want to play. I don't know if 20000 is going to do it, but that's probably your only hope. But if you have to go to those means, no, these games will never have the meaning they once did. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure out a way to make it uh, to, to, to make it anywhere remotely close to what it used to be. I just think that ship has sailed. Um, I mean, just look around. Compare 2013 to 2023. Now imagine what this bowl system with a 12-team playoff will look like in 2033. They're just going to be, they're going to be preseason games, exhibition games, completely. So that's what we're left with. Uh, by the way, everybody, th- uh, going to probably not read your questions verbatim. We've got a weird time crunch with just our schedules. Corey's on the road. I'm down here. Um, I've, you know. I'm working, but there's also other things that I might want to do. Anyhow, Porterhouse 62, uh, <laughs> thanks for the great coverage this year, uh, especially getting us through what is arguably the roughest month as in all I can remember. What should be Mike Norvell's resolution, in quotation marks, for 2024? Staff changes, recruiting philosophy. So um, thoughts on that one. Also, he says if we're within a score of UGA in the fourth quarter, uh, bowls have been known to get crazy. So let's hope for that. Yeah, just get the first part's the hard part there. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, develop one of those two freshman quarterbacks. Mm. That's the resolution. Get them ready to play in 2025. 
and then you've got two years at least of a really good quarterback running your system, and you don't have to do the portal dance again. So I would say that's the number one resolution. Get you a quarterback that can get that that is ready to play in 2025 for the next two seasons. I'm fine with the staff. I, I think I'd actually almost be kind of sad if they lost anybody outside of maybe one or two maybe. I'm not going to name their names. I don't want to be a jerk. It still is kind of the Christmas season technically. But the staff, I don't have a lot of – I mean, they're 13-0, and 0, everybody. Like, and I get it. Porterhouse yeah. isn't saying that there's problems here, but you can always get better, right? 1% better. How do you go about getting 1% better? And, like, yeah, listen, I don't know, man. Close better. But, again, like what does closing mean? Um, I think just keep on keeping on. And as Corey said, um, you know, develop one of these quarterbacks so that that probably takes a lot of pressure off of you and your collective to put resources into that position. If you can maybe grow it organically in grassroots, you're still got to pay those guys too, but probably not what you and Miami and whoever else is trying to throw at Cam Ward. So, um, yeah, let's, let's get those quarterbacks in-house developed a little bit quicker, a little bit better. Yeah. Noel Boyo, too. Gentlemen, Happy New Year. Corey, anything special planned in case of an upset victory Saturday against the Dogs? Also, your top three Jordan Travis games in his career at Florida State. That's a good question. What Do you have any ideas, Aslan, for what I could do? Because I, I really don't think they're going to win. So it could be something pretty outlandish. Uh, like eat dog food? Eat dog bone? <laughs> like gnaw on a dog bone or something? Yeah, how about that? Yeah, chew on a milk bone. Something that's kind of semi perhaps palatable i don't well, want to get suffer. one i don't know a grocery store you think i should but it, you think i should pack one just in case like that, that, no that'd be, jinxing bring it. It. that'd be jinxing it I, that's what i'm saying so i'd have to find a random one i mean ug is going to be there right maybe yeah, yeah. maybe i can just get some of his chow okay. uh, i'll figure out something but yes if they win this game i promise i will do it might not top champagne but i, I will do something to commemorate what would be the biggest upset uh, for Florida State since I've been covering them. What would you say, Jordan? I would say Oklahoma. Um, maybe North Carolina two years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And LSU? I was gonna, it's sad to say this, man. I, I don't know if any game he played this season is in there. I, I almost would say Florida last season is ahead of LSU this year. Yeah, I, I I probably agree with that. Those runs he made were incredible. Um, the LSU game, it's just, you know, we forget because they beat him so badly. But, you know, that was a game in the fourth quarter, and he made every play and every throw and was the best quarterback on the field with the field with a Heisman winner. Um, so that's why I gave that a little, uh, a little more love. But, yeah, you know, you could choose that one for sure. He was, uh, I mean, look, man, they won 19 in a row. 17 with him starting so there's a lot to choose from uh, bradley moss has a procedural rules question uh, after hearing you talk about jake garcia from his understanding players can transfer one time without having to sit out as well as being a grad transfer anything other than that you need to be granted a waiver in order to not have to sit out here is that correct uh no they now they've allowed multi multi transfer so you can you can do it more than once you can do it uh, more than just once as an undergrad and then that, and then that grad transfer wild card Uh, Because he was wondering about guys like JT Daniels, Keaton Slovis playing for so many different schools. I think Slovis had the coaching change. Might have been one of the reasons he was able to, like, get a hardship, if you will. But with JT Daniels, he, like, got within different windows of legislation being changed. Like, he got inside the window where it was laissez-faire, and then he went ahead and did as a grad transfer and then they came back and were like, oh, we're going to give everybody this one-time opportunity to do it for free. So then he used that again, I think, at that point to transfer from West Virginia to Rice because JT Daniels went from Southern Cal to Georgia to West Virginia to Rice. So it was a crazy time, everybody. Maybe some point they, they will have a hard and fast rule, but right now this rule, for as long as it will be hard and fast, is that there can be multi-time transfers. Um, so it's going to be the Wild West. Old dad's an old, Corey. Wake up. On the viewing of the gross FSU South Florida basketball game, the announcer said, you don't build a program anymore. You just build a team every year. I feel that it could not have been said any better, and it's basketball and football pretty much, which for anyone who has thought of those sports as special growing up, to me, it will eventually ruin it. One example is I haven't watched one minute of a bowl game yet. Happy New Year's, guys. Old dad. 
Thoughts on that one, Corey? Uh, I don't disagree. Do you? No. Uh, you still have to build a program. Right? That's still culture, right? I mean, you, to, to be 13-0, I mean, they built a great team, right? I mean, they, they accumulated great players and pieces, but there's an underpinning of, of a program behind that, right? I mean, it, it's not just Norvell. Like, he's got the right coaches. He's got the right support staff. Uh, there was enough guys like Jordan that had been with the program for several years, Maurice Smith, I think, that helped underpin the program aspect of it. But I guess, like, what, you have to re-recruit your team every year so maybe in that regards, yeah, you're building a team every single year. Well, and again, the depth chart, it used to be you'd look at the depth chart 2023 or 2022 and be like, okay, well, that kid's a freshman now, but by the time he's a junior, he's going to be a badass and he's going to be our starter at defensive end. Yeah. Well, now you, you just don't know. Like, you just don't know. So it, it's really hard to build, to, to a build a program when you're going to have so much turnover. And you're always going to have key spots where you fill in with free agency. So, I mean, you know, it's it's like the NFL. The NFL has like, well, I don't know, 20 guys, 18 guys. Look at the roster turnover in the NFL every year. That's kind of what college football has become. You get your core guys that you keep. But other than that, you, you're always going to be sprinkling sprinkling in new guys. It doesn't mean culture doesn't, doesn't matter. It just means roster building is always going to be a challenge because you have to do it every year. Jangalang, everybody, wake up. Can you think of another game like this in FSU history? The circumstances make it so bizarre, I'm not even sure how I'll feel watching it. Pissed, disappointed, sad, quickly come to mind, but it will also just be so weird watching what amounts to a spring roster playing a major bowl game against an opponent like UGA after such a great season. What strange times, eh? Anywho, thanks for all you do, and Happy New Year's, boys. I just got like a, a little tinge there of like what other people probably felt when we were being really you know, self-loathing and moping. And I love you, Jangling. I'm not saying that you are there. Uh, I don't know, man. I just, I don't know. I wish I could go back into a time machine and have the heart of 19-year-old Aslan that was just so pissed off anytime Florida State lost or something bad happened. But I don't know, man. I've just, I have processed the grief. I have, I don't know, I don't know if I pre-grieved because I was expecting possibly Florida State to maybe not make it in. Uh, but I've just been able to kind of accept this game for what it's going to be and I don't know I'm just I, talking to these kids being down here I think they're going to play really hard I don't think they're necessarily going to win the football game but I, I don't think they're just going to roll over and look absolutely pathetic which I know that's not like a really high bar to clear so I, I think maybe that fear resides in a lot of you folks that this is going to be like a very embarrassing sort of outcome and not only will the game go bad but then it's going to create all these narratives if you will, about, you know, was the committee right? Was the committee wrong? And maybe you're fearing some of that. Listen, man, it's a game that I think most people realize they're going to show graphics, I'm sure, throughout this game, telling you what Florida State lost. Maybe they'll even have a screenshot of Corey's tweet about how many touchdowns they scored this year and how many are mm. on the field currently at this point. So I'm not worried about this becoming an indictment of this team or this program moving forward, this coaching staff. But, no, I mean, it, yeah, but – I cannot think of another game that's been like this because we've only had the playoff for whatever nine seasons and there's never been a team that went undefeated in the power five that beat an LSU that beat a Florida that beat a Miami that beat a Clemson that's been left out of it but these guys that are going to play the game and they're going to play the game every bit with fiber that that it matters to them so I guess maybe I'm being naive but yeah that's where I'm at with it can any other thing match up to this what about the music city bowl does it remind you of that at all Oh, yeah, there's a very rally around the flag moment in that game, too, right, Corey? Just like, mm -hmm. you know, obviously they were short staff, but it was like, man, whoever's going to play that game, we love you. Please fight like hell. And yeah, that's a really great comparison, actually, Corey. If you have any more uh, space you want to explore on that, feel free to. I don't want to step in your way now. No, I don't. Go ahead. Next question. All right. We're dealing with technical difficulties, everybody, but we're still putting on a show for you because uh, we advertise it on the message board and we don't want to go back on our words. George and Old 86, wake up. What do you feel is Mike Norvell's greatest strength? What do you feel is his greatest opportunity? Also, over under Alex Atkins, still coaching at Florida State. I'll take the under on that one. What about you, Corey? What's the number? Three. Oh, I didn't hear the number. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, under. Yes, I'll take the under on that as well. And then greatest strength, greatest opportunity uh, for Norvell. I don't know about the opportunity, but the consistency of message yes. in the belief that he garners with his players. 
I think that's by far his biggest strength. Yeah. That was an ambulance that just passed me, everyone. <laughs> Y'all can hear that. It's not coming from me. It's past me going in the other direction. Oh, uh, absolutely, man. I, I think the, the ability to get guys to buy in, uh, motivate them to, to the degree that he was able to this year. Uh, and also, this sounds really weird. Not that this guy has anything to prove to this guy that's talking on a podcast or whatever. Uh, but if they play hard the way I think they are going to, and if they're able to keep this game close, I don't know if that's the case. Now, I will gain a huge, huge amount of respect uh, for this coaching staff, specifically the head coach. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, this is this is one of those, like, a, all the odds are against you games. And if he can figure out a way to, to keep this thing close, like, that, that was, like, some of those weird, ugly games in 17 with Jimbo were just disgusting, right? But, like, that 17 game against Clemson, like those are the kind of games I'm like, man, I know you didn't win it, but the fact that you had pretty much no shot going to that game, everybody left you for dead, but you, somehow you you got your guys playing well for 57 minutes of the game, was like, all right, man, like, I can live with that. I can live with that. That's what makes me feel good about the future. He left the next year, in case you guys don't remember. Um, and that's why I have Mike Norvell now. And it's going great. Huge Knowles fan, Corey, says, wake up. Hope this finds you both well. Longtime member of War Chant here, listener of your show since its inception. Checking in finally from Fairhope, Alabama, home of Nate Andrews. He was on the 2013 National Championship team, significant contributor as a true freshman. Anyhow, just curious, what's your favorite Knoll Bowl game you attended and got to enjoy as a fan? Uh, he and his father went to the Sugar Bowl in 98. Uh, we were guests in the Marriott suite thanks to his job. They flat out dominated Ohio State, 31-14. to Good times in New Orleans for sure. Thanks for all you do. Happy New Year to you both. Scalp them. Go Knowles. As a fan, I didn't really go to a lot of bowls. So I'm going to say the Nebraska game in 93. Or 90, January 1st, 1994 was my favorite bowl game that I went to as a, as a fan. What about you? Oh, man, this is great. Uh, in case in case you're wondering, like, do we realize that Corey's voice is uh, fluctuating? We do. We do. So we're, we're just trying to – he's our star player, and we're just trying to get him across the finish line. Uh, maybe at some point, his sir, maybe we need to look into getting you a different cell service. I don't want to say who you have for your phone service because maybe they do a great job most of the time. But um, as a fan, I don't think I ever saw – no, it always comes back. We get asked this question a lot, but I think it comes back to Bowden, that or the Gator Bowl 2009 season. Uh, that's the best one as a fan because I went as a fan. I mean, the bowl games I went to was 2002 season Sugar Bowl, lost that one. 2003 Orange Bowl, lost that one. Uh, I don't think I went to the bowl game in 2004. So I'll go with the Bowden Bowl game in 2009 as the best one because it's – a little bit of struggle in that one. Uh, I was at the national championship game, but that's a whole other animal. So I'll just go with like a regular conventional bowl game. I'll say Gator Bowl 2009. Too bad vitaminenergy.com has that great promo code WordChampBogo, uh, but the caffeine only can energize yourself and not your cellular service. But maybe somebody will figure that out long, long time from now. But in the meantime, go to vitaminenergy.com. Use the promo code WARCHAMPBOGO. That's WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. Buy one, get one free. Florida State alums pulling the strings on that promo code right there. 260 milligrams of all-natural caffeine. No sugar. Means no sugar crash. Yeah, but how's it taste, Aslan? Try the sour apple. Try the tango orange. Then come ask me how it tastes, Aslan. You can try the multi-pack. The variety pack is available. So if you're not sure if you want your mood to be boosted, maybe your focus, maybe your workouts, get the variety pack. You can try them all. And when you use the promo code word BOGO, as we all know, you buy one, you get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. So what you waiting for? Your news resolution is going to be a lot easier to crush with some more energy in your hands whenever you need it on demand. So try it out. Shake it and take it. VitaminEnergy.com. Promo code WARCHAMPBOGO, B-O-G-O. I'm going to read this one, Corey. It's just a statement from Drill Sergeant Porter. Then I'm going to read a soliloquy from our guy, Mark. And then maybe by that time, your voice will have regulated itself. Drill Sergeant Porter says, wake up. All I can say is I actually feel bad for Georgia because they have no idea what's coming for them Saturday. FSU by 100. LOL. Oh, LOL. Seriously, though. Thank you both for the shows throughout the year. I wish both of you a very happy new year. Go Knowles. Driving to Miami Saturday morning. All right, man. Good for you. 
Safe travels on the Alligator Alley, friend. Mark Naples, wake up. By the way, happy new year to you, Mark. I woke up this morning thinking about what a week for Brock and the coaches, right? I mean, bowl weeks are supposed to be fun. You know your systems. Uh, they know what they do well and don't do well. They do a little prep for your opponent. Then you just go play an exhibition game. But this week for Florida State, your starting quarterback bounces five days before the game on Christmas. You insert a true freshman with four days of prep on top of traveling, bowl activities. The same true freshman who threw for 55 yards against Louisville. And Georgia is not Louisville. I mean, are Mike, Tony, Alex, and Brock burning the midnight oil at the hotel? Are they breaking down film until they literally can't stay awake? Or is it futile at this point and you just try to enjoy the week and go play? Avoiding a blowout is huge. Can't give ESPN the narrative they want. Can't let kids on a 13-0 team who did choose to compete in this game leave with a terrible taste in their mouths. Go Knowles more than ever. Yeah, no, man, I think... I get it, man. We think this is like some kind of movie and they're all like, hey, man, can we, let's watch everything we can. We need to figure out a way to win this game. Uh, man, they're just going to do what they've done. They're going to prepare him. Not like he's Jordan Travis and he's played, you know, 2,000 snaps of football. But, man, they have they know what he's probably comfortable doing. They know what they were able to do against Louisville, what they weren't able to do against Louisville, how it stacks up. And they're going to try, man. I think they're going to throw some things in there probably that are maybe we haven't seen before. I'm, I'm sure they're going to go for broke and trying to, you know, be competitive and win this football game. I don't think there's any kind of defeatist attitude on that staff at all. But, no, I mean, this, I don't think this is like this uh, really cool moment where – they're taking shifts of just staying up all hours of the night to figure something out. I just think they trust their process, and they'll they'll work it as best they can and, and just hope for the best, really, at this point. Yeah, they know what they're up against, right? They're there to compete. Uh, they know the the disparity in talent. Um, you know, I, I, I would be interested in what Norvell will say after the game um, about, you know, this. if he admits, you know, this wasn't my team, this wasn't any indication of what we were this season. I, I, mean, I hope Brock plays well, but, again – it, it's one thing to have Brock Glenn, you know, a third-string quarterback, playing with all the starters. You could foresee a scenario where good things could happen. But you have a third-string quarterback playing with no skill players that have started all season. So that's that's where the reality lies. So I don't think you – and I also don't think you overload Brock Glenn. Just you kind of want him to go have fun. Like yeah. kind of enjoy the moment and embrace it and have fun and don't put too much pressure on him because there shouldn't be any pressure on him. Uh, by the way, I don't know if I already mentioned it, but we're gonna probably we're gonna get every question in here, but I'm not gonna read everything verbatim. Uh, so let's go to Blue Knoll. Good morning, wake up. He thought it was odd that Jarian opted out after opting in. Uh, do you think some of the players actually met as a group and talked this through, or even talked with Norvell as a group? I'm not there. I don't think that's. I don't think that happened. I don't. I don't think this is like a silent protest either. I think for guys like Jarian who opted in, I, I think he probably had maybe a little bit more optimistic outlook on who was going to be there and then maybe as other guys decide not to play or maybe maybe he tweaked something for all we know man listen yeah there's there's practices we weren't able to see maybe he wasn't right and he didn't want to risk it going in this game um, but I don't think there was any kind of collective group like yeah man screw these guys man they, they took this away from us we're not going to give them the satisfaction of watching us play football I, I I'm not there no if they were going to do that they would have done that three weeks ago that it wouldn't be a trickle down effect like like it's been. Yeah, I, I have no idea why you would opt in and opt out. I have no idea why Bernardo Green practiced for I, I don't know two weeks and then decided not to do it. Same with Tate, uh, but they did, uh, and we, we all move on. We all wish him well. Patches ten twenty one. Um, he uh, wake up back in July. He ended his eighteen year career with the United States Army. Fantastic oh, man! Look at that. Yeah, uh, man. I, Hopefully I can be with Warchamp for 18 years. I would be 12 more years of doing this. How many more national mm-hmm. titles would we uh, would I enjoy? Three? Two. Okay. Two. Okay. Two. Uh, he came back home to Tallahassee, became a first-time season ticket holder and booster. He's going to the Orange Bowl this weekend for the first-ever bowl game with his 16-year-old nephew. What are some things that we should do to take in the full Orange Bowl experience? Would love to meet Corey and Aslan. You guys are me and my nephew's favorite podcast to listen to. If the grammar was bad there, that was me trying to parse it down. So don't don't blame our guy Patches. I don't know, man. Uh, is there probably some fan fan experience probably around the stadium or something, I'm guessing? Isn't there a parade? Sure. Is there a parade? I know, but I like know, you, it's probably an Orange Bowl parade, maybe. Sixteen year old nephew doesn't want to go to the uh, Orange Bowl parade. Sixteen-year-olds love parades, Aslan. Okay, they love them. Brady, Brady's always begging me to go take him to as many parades as possible. 
Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't Friday. Know. I think something. To, there has to be something tonight, right? Like maybe like to, to your, not maybe a parade, but some sort of like the teams all. I remember we went when we were in El Paso. There was something at like the El Paso Civic Center where like both teams were there and like at least got like on stage and like waved to people. So um, I am unfortunately I don't have the itinerary for those kind of events, but I would imagine perhaps that's going down on uh, Friday. I know that uh, Coach and Kirby will be at jungle island for a luncheon mm. from 11 a.m to 2 p.m today so if you're in town maybe swing by jungle island crash the party bring the ruckus yeah and just be loud be loud and uh don't bark don't bark along with all the georgia fans i can't imagine there's gonna be a lot of georgia fans there either just it's gonna not be a hopefully it'll be a huge florida state uh contingent that shows up because the tickets are cheaper than you would have imagined a florida state georgia orange bowl uh would be uh, well, this is anticlimactic. The last question uh, was just a spot in line. He never got back in here to finish out his question before we locked the thread. So uh, that's a wrap. Any last thoughts here, Corey, as we hang out? Final show of the year, uh, Big Dog. Mm, yeah. Um, before we bring on our, our Georgia insider uh, to talk about the game. Uh, I was thinking maybe my bowl, my first bowl game was the 82 Gator Bowl. And that was a very fun experience, although we, I, it was a deluge. Uh, but that was fun. If, if I was thinking about bowl games I went to, it's just weird because back in the dynasty days, because you were so spoiled as a Florida State fan, at least I was, and I lived in Atlanta, but, like, um, if they weren't playing for a national championship, we didn't go to the bowl game. That's how that's how it worked back then. It's like, what? What is this? They're just playing Ohio State in the Sugar Bowl? No, that's no fun. We don't, we don't run doing that. Um, so yeah, that's just, that's the perspective. But even back then, all the players played, uh, but different time, Aslan, different time. And yeah, I would say no matter what happens Saturday, clearly you guys know this, do not use that as an indictment of what this team accomplished. It does, in my opinion, it doesn't sour what this team accomplished. I shouldn't even say this team, what happens on Saturday has no bearing on what the 2023 Florida state football team accomplished. Because it is not the 2023 Florida State football team on display Saturday at 4. It's Florida State players. A lot of them will play next year. It is a great experience for those guys. And I hope they play well and I hope they shock the world. But whether it's 12 to 10 or 40 to 10, don't let that sour. Don't let what happens on Saturday sour the overall excitement and love and joy you had this season. Let what happened in that conference room sour all that. This team deserves to be playing on New Year's Day. It's not, and uh, this is the result. But I hope they play well. I, I know they'll play hard, and let's see what Brad Glenn's got. Wake Up War Champs, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Aslan Hunchavani back here with you folks. We are in Fort Lauderdale, or Davie, I guess, technically. Uh, joined by Sudu Upadea, who crossed paths with me somewhat, maybe in Mississippi, but maybe not all that much. But all roads lead back to Mississippi, obviously. Sudu does great work right now with uh, Fox 5 in Atlanta. Sudu, thanks for taking time out, man. How's life down here in South Florida for you? It's good, man. Can't complain, right? December in South Florida, that's I'm pretty sure a lot of people are envious of us. I know Florida State fans probably wanted to be somewhere else, so do Georgia fans. But, I mean, if this is the consolation, it's not a bad one. Indeed. Hey, let's start there, Sudu. Um Obviously, it's been well chronicled on this program, uh, just how distraught, uh, downtrodden Florida State fans and the program has been being left out of the playoff, seemingly putting on the brave face. They're going through the motion. I don't say they're going to go through the motions, man, but they're they're saying the right things and they're seemingly dialed in for this game. Georgia might have just as big of an argument for disappointment for being here in Miami. What have you seen from the team? I know that the practice on Thursday got rained out. You'll be out there later on Friday to check things out, but what were the practices like in Athens and what have you kind of seen from the team ever since they've been down here in South Florida in terms of, I guess, their comportment? Yeah, they are very focused and taking this game very seriously. Like, you know, I, I was, you know, in the mindset, look, it's a bowl game. They've had a hard season. You know, they're going to take it easy, but I'll, I'll give you the the best I guess soundbite of the day that I got earlier today is from quarterback Carson Beck. I was like, "Hey, how are you relaxing? How are you taking all this in?" And he looked at me and went, "Honestly, I'm not. You know, I'm I'm treating this. I'm I'm here to play football. That's what I'm here to do." He mentioned the beach outing that they had yesterday, and he was like, "We're out there on the beach the whole time. I wanted to go back to the hotel and watch film. Like they are on a mission to prove something in this game. I think the fact that Florida State ended up fifth 
over them, I think, means something to some of these guys. We heard that from defensive lineman Michael Williams yesterday. He said, I think they forgot about us a little bit. So, I mean, there some of these guys are having fun, but the, Kirby Smart has done a really good job of giving them a mission, which is let's send out our senior classes, the winningest senior class in Georgia football history, and that some of these guys just have personal things that they want to accomplish uh, and kind of remind people, look, Georgia should have had a spot in the CFP as well. So they're extremely focused, man. I, I've covered a lot of bowl games, different teams, and I've never seen anything like this. I mean, they're treating it like it's a semifinal game. Not trying to break any news here, painting in a corner, uh, but agree or disagree, Sudu. Lad McConkey probable, Brock Bowers doubtful for Saturday. Agree. Yeah, I think Lad will play. I think Brock Bowers and Marius Mims, I think it's pretty safe to say. It's not official, but based on what I'm hearing as well from people in Athens, um, doesn't look like those two will play. All right. Let's keep it on the offense then with, with Carson Beck in this uh, attack. You know, I, I think I've, I've long held this kind of contention with, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the Mark Direct offenses that were you know good but not great. Uh, you look at the, the conventional, traditional stats on this offense, you know, eighth in yards, uh, scoring offense, ninth. Uh, they're every bit as potent as you would think a, a top level program would be, but we think of defense when it comes to Georgia so much. What has been, I guess, some of the keys for this offense to maintaining uh, excellence on that side of the ball, despite losing Stetson Bennett, despite losing Todd Munkin uh, to the NFL, what's allowed them to continue this and, and will they be able to, even if they don't have Brock on Saturday? I think so. Yeah. I, th I think it all just goes back to familiarity on, on multiple sides of it. I mean, you've got Mike Bobo who was obviously he's been at Georgia played there, you know, was, was with Mark Richt left and then Kirby brought him back as an offensive analyst a year ago. So he, they're basically running this, a very similar offense, a couple tweaks here and there, but Bobo obviously knows the program inside and out played with Kirby and then has worked with Carson. So that familiarity helped them. Carson also being there for this entire time and playing behind Fromm and then Stetson. And, you know, so I just think, you know, people talk about oh, Stetson's leaving. They're losing a lot of production. But I mean, Carson was a talented quarterback coming out of high school. And he just sat in that system for, you know, three, four years, just picking it all up. And Kirby always talks about it. He's like, I've been seeing this Carson Beck you guys are seeing for, for years now. It's just we had other guys that could step up and, you know, had the advantage to start. But this guy's been soaking all this stuff in, and and we don't see that a lot in college football, obviously, and, and especially the last few years with transfers. But, you know, this is like the old school thing where a guy just sits behind and waits for his turn, and, and you know, he's learned it inside and out. You know, seemingly the, the passing offense has been paced ahead of, of the rushing attack for Georgia, which is something that, you know, maybe people outside the, the SEC bubble don't think of when they when they think about this Georgia team. Del McGee, the, the running backs coach, did speak to the media on Thursday. I mean, where are they at with running the ball right now? I mean, is it still hit? If Kendall Milton can get right, does that change the dynamic for them? And Mary Smims not being in the mix, maybe that, uh, you know, puts a, a little bit of wrench in the plans. But obviously, he's missed time. So uh, is this running game still a work in progress? Or they, have they kind of found their niche? And this is simply what this offense is, maybe just a little bit more reliant on the pass attack. Yeah, I think uh, later in the season, it really came around. And I think it had to do with Kendall becoming healthier. I mean, you got to, when this season started, they're, I mean, they were down. I mean, Dejon Edwards was hurt. Kendall was hurt. Their, you know, top running back this year, Branson Robinson, he, you know, he was out for the season in fall camp. So coming into the season, it was like, okay, who's going to step up in the backfield for them? Because everybody's injured. And as the season kind of wore on, we saw these guys get healthier. Uh, we saw really, I mean, Dejon carried the load for the most part. But then as the season wore on, Kendall Milton stepped up big. I mean, dating back to the Ole Miss game. Uh, at Georgia Tech. I mean, he 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 has been. I think he's had the most rushing yards out of anybody as far as like a single game performance is concerned. So they they've been fine. You mentioned you know Mims not being there when you're recruiting all these five stars in the offense. I mean, it's it's been plug and play for Georgia. You know, and and I covered Ole Miss for nice a long time. Must be real nice. Must be real nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. I covered Ole Miss like you for a long time, and you know, I've, so I had some experience covering an SEC program, but. I've never seen anything quite like what George is doing, right? Like they just recruit, you know, a million five stars and four stars out of high school. And these guys are getting legitimate reps in, in practice, even if they're not playing. So when it's time to step up, they're ready. I mean, they're good to go. They have the talent and size. And it's it's truly remarkable, man, what Kirby's done over here. I, You know, it's my first year covering this team, seeing them from afar. But seeing it up close is it's just wild. Yeah. Uh Kirby's calling card is defense. Let's pivot to that side of the ball. I know this isn't necessarily a team that is sack reliant, sack heavy, but 
I mean, what is it about Glenn Schulman and, and what they try to get done? It, I guess does it come down simply to pressuring the, the quarterback and they're so successful at that that everything just kind of falls in line for them success-wise when it comes to defense? It's a little bit of everything. I mean, each level of this defense. And once again, it goes back to talent. I think it just makes – it starts there and makes everybody's jobs easier. But we know Kirby's a great defensive mind, and so is Glenn Schumann. Um, it, it, honestly, you look at the defensive line. They've got a lot of big bodies. They don't have the same names we've seen in the past, obviously, the Jordan Davises or the Nicobe Deans. But it, it's more of a team effort instead of just like a one-guy kind of thing. So co- when they all come together – they, they get to the quarterback, they pressure the – even if they're not getting sacks, they're pressuring the quarterback. And then you look on the back end of this defense, that secondary is amazing. I mean, you have All-Americans all over – Malachi Starks, Kamari Lassiter's a lockdown guy. Uh, Tyke Smith has been very reliable in that kind of dual safety, sort of linebacker star kind of role. Javon Bullard's another – so at each level of this defense – and you look at the linebackers, they just – they lost Javon Dumas Johnson, who was the leader of their defense, a guy who called plays – uh, I believe it was maybe two, three games left in the season. He got hurt. He ended up having to transfer because the two freshmen that were behind him stepped up so big, there was no guarantee he was going to get as much playing time coming back. We're talking about a starter who left, who transferred, because the guys who stepped up in his place when he got hurt were just more impressive. So, once again, I just go back to the, the level of talent on this defense is absolutely incredible. And when you add the coaching you have, it, it's a, it's just a crazy mix, man. And when they came out of that bye week at the end of October, I mean, they really, they turned it up, Sudo. I mean, they, they trounced Florida. Uh, Missouri is a, a game opponent, but they were able to, to pull by them. Obviously took it to Ole Miss, took it to Tennessee. I know the Georgia Tech game might, probably wasn't as close as that final score, but then they fall against Alabama. I mean, I don't want to say like a vulnerability, but I mean, they hit such a strong stride, but then that Alabama game kind of brought to a screeching halt. There's there's probably nothing about the Alabama game that has a parallel to what Florida State is, but uh, what were some of maybe the vulnerabilities throughout the, the, the season that Georgia might have had that ultimately kind of came to roost in that game against Alabama that might not have been able to get buttoned up by the time they play that game Saturday in the bowl game? Yeah, I think the the bigger thing, and then you know, you gotta you gotta fill me in on who you know the quarterback. You guys are gonna Florida State's gonna be putting yeah. out there, and and what what he's gonna be able to do. But the one thing teams were able to do really well is running the ball with their quarterback. Running the ball in general was was not as strong as years past as far as Georgia's run defense is concerned. But it's it was really dual threat quarterbacks, and all season we said. You know, people covering the team are like, hey, if they get a guy who can run and throw at an elite level, like we saw Jalen Milrow at the end of the season, that could give this team problems. And we saw that firsthand. I mean, Milrow had a ton of time back there, but he was able to use his legs and he had a big arm and he was really able to attack Georgia that way. But I mean, all season long, you saw Peyton Thorne at Auburn and Robbie Ashford. I mean, they they were able to put a lot of, you know, uh, rushing yards on this Georgia defense early in the season. And we kind of saw it throughout the season. The only difference was these quarterbacks weren't necessarily elite passers. So, you know, my thing was, hey, if, if they get into the playoff and they face even a guy like Penix, could give them problems because we know he's got a big arm. We also know he can run the ball a little. And I think that's kind of been the case. Dual threat quarterbacks that are truly both good passers and rushers, that to me has was the difference in, in why Alabama was able to win that game. Yeah, Brock Glenn, not, not quite Jalen Milrow yet. Not quite Jalen Milrow yeah. yet. <laughs> um, yeah, not statuesque, but, you know, a little bit more physical than you would or, or athletic than you would think. But, yeah, he's he's not a, a, a dual threat in any kind of real definition of, of, of that. That position has kind of evolved into being. And they had trouble moving the ball against Louisville, um, which didn't provide a lot of resistance against Southern Cal and their second string quarterback the other night. But that's too yeah. much, you know transitory property going out there but yeah florida state obviously going to have their work cut out for them you don't have to give us give it actually give us a score prediction sudo take go on a limb out there um i I, i'm sure you see a very optimistic uh finish here for georgia but what would you say uh happens saturday out there pro pro player some still call it but uh, hard rock stadium out there in miami gardens okay before i give this i just want to let your listeners know that I have the highest respect for Mike Norvell and and who he is as a person, as a program builder. I covered him at, at Memphis and saw what he was able to do there directly. Um, so I respect him, and I Florida State's in great hands, right? It's just very unfortunate that he doesn't have his his weapons at his disposal to against this team. I mean, it, it would have been really cool to see everybody 
with Jordan there and, and Keon and everybody playing this game. It would have been remarkable to see this matchup. I think it would have been close. It would have been competitive. Without those guys, it's really hard for me to see any path for Florida State to win this game. I mean, I, I could see a scenario where Georgia's dropping, you know, 40, 45 points plus in this game. Uh, they are so focused on this game, and they, they are so determined to win, not just win, but win big. You know, I was talking to a coworker earlier, and he, he brought up the, uh, the Hawaii-Georgia Sugar Bowl game from like 2000 and 2008 or 2009, yeah. whenever that was. Right and he was like, look, he's like, yeah, I remember the Colt Brennan game. Yeah, <laughs> it's looking like it might be that. So I know that's not what Florida State fans want to hear, but I'm sure they also understand, you know, what's going on. And, and it seems like one side is extremely focused and the other side's kind of like, you know, we got left out. It is what it is. So, yeah. Uh, you want to give us a cool Nor? You got any Norvell anecdotes uh, on the way out to, to buoy the, the spirits of my listeners? Here, <laughs> um, he was just the nicest guy, man. It, when I when I first got there, so I was 21 and right out of college and had just gotten this job and. Um, I remember like my first time meeting him, he, he kind of made me go in front of the camera and interviewed me. He asked me a bunch of questions and, um, he was always very accessible. He gave us his number and, and was just, was very nice at Memphis and, and did such a phenomenal job. Uh, he did light up. Uh, he, 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 he kind of yelled at me one time at practice. Um, I was covering Memphis and I was shooting. I forgot what I was doing, but I was somewhere where I was not supposed to be. He dropped a few expletives and, and told me to get out of the way. But later he came back around and was like, hey, look, it, it was about protecting you. I don't want you to get hurt. Um, so he was always really nice, easy to deal with. And um, you guys got a good one, man. He's an, an elite offensive mind dating back to his time at Arizona State. You guys have seen it, uh, what he's been able to do in Tallahassee. And uh, I'm ex just excited to see the journey for him. Yeah. I'm not excited for Saturday, though, but that's uh, that's for another <laughs> time. Appreciate the time. Check him out on social media if you're on the Instagram, kids. Uh, Sudu TV, S U D U TV on Twitter. I'm still calling it Twitter, everybody. Sudu, S U D U underscore TV. Sudu Upadea joining us here on Wake Up War Chant from Fox 5 in Atlanta. Sudu, thanks, man. Appreciate your time. Thank you, man. Oh, it's that part of the show where I'm kind of whispering now. It's late. Recorded this part late to add to the show. It's mybookie.ag, everybody. Promo code is WARCHANT. Use that for an instant cash deposit bonus. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere at mybookie.ag. What's going on today? Kentucky Clemson? Clemson favored by four. Hmm. Notre Dame favored by six against Oregon State. Is, is Sam Hartman playing? Check that out for me, folks. If he is... Let's go ahead and take the Irish. And, wow, Iowa State 10.5 on Memphis. That's kind of stinky. Let's lean into it. We'll take Iowa State minus 10.5. You've got hunches. Play them over at mybookie.ag. Just use the promo code WARCHANT when you sign up for the first time. You'll get that instant cash deposit bonus. Mybookie.ag. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere. Thanks again to Sudu. And for Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you, folks, for listening to another year, another season of Wake Up WARCHANT presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Press conference, Kirby and Mike, 8.30 in the morning. So check out War Chant around 9 o'clock, 9.30. We'll have reaction, maybe even a War Chant wrap, maybe even a War Chant report. Grind don't stop for us. Again, though, really, um, thanks so much, everybody. We really appreciate you folks tuning in every single day, telling your friends, uh, let's run it back. Let's do it a whole nother year. Let's go undefeated again, huh? Yeah, let's do that. Again, for everybody on today's show, we say thank you for listening to the Wake Up War Chant podcast presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.